Donald Trump, he recently sat down for a joint interview with two major European newspapers where he slammed German Chancellor Angela Merkel for her open door policy on refugees. Now, Trump told the papers, quote, I think she made one very catastrophic mistake, and that was taking all of these illegals, you know, taking all of the people from wherever they come from. And nobody even knows where they come from. So I think she made a catastrophic mistake, a very bad mistake. A black man in Illinois is suing police after he says that he was falsely and violently arrested. The 2015 encounter was captured on several cameras. It happened in Evanston, and that's right, that's located right side, right outside of Chicago, rather. The video was just recently released. The man says that officers used excessive force after a passerby called 911 to report a possible car break-in. As Dean Reynolds shows us what happened next, it was recorded by a camera in the car. The alleged suspect was driving. I think this person is still following me now. I see it. On October 10th, 2015, a dash cam in Lawrence Crosby's car picked up his cell phone conversation. So they're trying to play some games. All right, I'm about to go to the police station now. The 25 year old Northwestern University PhD candidate considered going to the Evanston Police Department for protection from a trailing driver. You know how it is with black people, man. They think they're always trying to do something wrong. Little did he know, just minutes earlier, that driver following behind had called the cops on him, accusing him of grand theft auto. Um, he was African American with a black hood. In his rearview mirror, Crosby watched the police creep closer. Did I pull me over? See? Moments later, the engineering student got out with his hands up and was taken down by four officers. On the ground, on the ground! I purchased this vehicle January 23rd, 7th, 2015. From Libertyville Chevrolet. I have all the evidence. This is something that could have been checked on a computer. Tim Tuohy is Crosby's attorney. He was struck at least by one police officer with multiple blows. Why am I being in the we got to verify the car is not stolen. When the police on the scene confirmed the car was Crosby's, one officer reacted this way. I said, I didn't shoot you, man. You should feel lucky for that. As for that concerned caller, once she witnessed the arrest, she seemed to waver. I feel really, like, I feel really, like, I don't, I didn't mean to, like, racial profile. Crosby was charged with resisting arrest, but was acquitted last year. For CBS This Morning, Dean Reynolds, Chicago. Me too. A lawsuit filed on Crosby's behalf last year demands the city pay him $50,000. No Evanston police officer were disciplined. And an internal investigation determined their acts complied with policy, but the department has promised changes and challenges. Elements of the video they call that problematic. That video, guys, is so tough to watch. You wonder, how is he resisting arrest that even when you do the right thing, apparently, yeah. it still ends up in a bad way? Well, his hands are up, his you know, and when up. you're pulled over, you just have an officer usually come up and say, can I see your ID? Mm -hmm. Can I see your registration? It's usually a different type of encounter. Mm -hmm. I need First to hear more. Yeah. It was apparent on the video. Yes. Yeah. And to hear the officer say, be glad I didn't shoot you. Very mm -hmm. tough. Yeah. Since we launched this investigation in December of 2015, the Justice Department has deployed our largest team ever in a policing pattern or practice case to conduct a thorough and fair investigation of the Chicago Police Department and independent police review authority. We found that the Chicago Police Department engages in a pattern or practice of using excessive force, including deadly force and non-deadly force. This pattern includes, for example, shooting at people who present no immediate threat and tasing people for not following verbal commands. This conduct doesn't only harm residents, it endangers officers. It results in avoidable deaths and injuries and trauma. And it erodes police community trust, trust that truly is the cornerstone of public safety. We found that this pattern of unconstitutional force is largely attributable to systemic deficiencies within the CPD and the city. We found that CPD does not adequately train its officers to use the appropriate amount of force. We found that Chicago's accountability systems are broken. Many complaints that should be investigated are not. And when investigations do occur, they are glacially slow and staffed by overworked and undertrained investigators who often fail to obtain basic witness statements and evidence. Officers are too rarely held accountable for misconduct, and when they are, discipline is unpredictable and ineffective. And we found that CPD is failing to provide officers with the support that they need to deal with the stress and trauma of their jobs. The failures that we identified and that we heard about from residents and officers alike have deeply eroded community trust, 
particularly in African American and Latino communities, suffering the most from gun violence on Chicago's south and west sides. These neighborhoods are the hardest hit by CPD's pattern of unlawful force and breakdown in the city's accountability systems. These breakdowns breed distrust and undermine police legitimacy in the very communities that need fair, proactive policing the most. Distrust of law enforcement makes residents unwilling to share information, and that makes it harder for officers to solve and prevent crimes. Chicago's leaders, including especially the mayor and superintendent, of course, are aware of many of these problems, and to their credit, have been working to address them. As noted in this report, we've already improved and expanded de-escalation training, and we're upgrading our use of force policies. We're providing every officer with body cameras and tasers. We've expanded recruitment efforts to ensure that the department draws on all the communities that make up this great city. We've improved transparency and strengthened our oversight and accountability. We have, we have changed the way our first responders react to individuals with serious mental illness so that they know the difference between a mental health call and a crime call. But I want to be clear. The Chicago Police Department, the city of Chicago, is already on the road to reform and there are no U-turns on that road. I am pleased to announce today that the Department of Justice and the City of Chicago have agreed to begin negotiations on an independently monitored, court-enforceable consent decree. It is very, very clear a transition is coming in Washington, but the departure of one or two people, and yes, the top people of the Department of Justice move on, but this agreement is not dependent on one or two or three people. This agreement is to, has been negotiated and is dependent upon the career lawyers, both here in Chicago and in Washington. Also, it is dependent upon the partnership with the elected officials here, the police department here, as well as the community residents here in Chicago. Unreal. This is so unreal. $2,500 to agitate. More paid protesters for the inauguration day. You need to know what's going on. We just did a report literally a few minutes after or before this had happened, before Drudge tweeted that. Better get ready. Five signs it all begins this Friday, inauguration day. The inauguration of Donald Trump is just days away, and there have already been significant signs that something big will potentially take place. This video here is by Project Veritas, Veritas, not Veritas, excuse me, and it is, it is shocking. Extremist leftist groups are planning several events under the umbrella of Disrupt J20. The exposed plans that they've got so far, that they've shown so far, are to set off stick bombs to make the entire building evacuate. And of course, the other one was to set off all the sprinkler alarms. You need to see what's going on. You need to see this video. The other thing is, uh, this video here is by Melissa Dykes and the Daily Sheeple. There are five extreme signs that something is going to happen on January 20th. And then, that, and then now we see this. Ads are offering protesters up to $2,500 to agitate. Can President Obama explain what he means when he says certain actions and policies of the government of Iran continue to pose an unusual and extraordinary threat to the national security, foreign policy, and economy of the United States? Other than having an economic policy fitting its own circumstances as it sees fit and aligning with countries like Russia, which the U.S. is attempting to wage war with, there is no justification for the outgoing president to keep sanctions on Iran in place and tensions between the two at such high levels. If all the countries that adhere to the JCPOA agree that the Iranian government is living up to its agreement, 
then it only shows that the U.S. foreign policy establishment sees Iran's other actions, whatever they may be, as cause for U.S. condemnation, and that its concerns for Iran's nuclear policies is merely a smokescreen for handing incoming President Trump and his foreign policy establishment an excuse to maintain a policy based more on hysteria than reality. Geopolitics is shifting, and the U.S. is becoming more and more marginalized. Russia, China, and its client states are rising up in prominence as the U.S.'s role in the world is waning. With the advent of President Trump heading foreign policy, the world is likely to attempt to humor the U.S., no more respect us, and even more so to fear us. There are so many other countries in the world who pose an extraordinary threat to the United States. Saudi Arabia and Israel dictate to the U.S. what its policies are in the Middle East, creating more enemies of the U.S. every day. After all, this is the only president that has been bombing the Middle East every day of his presidency. China is an economic force that certainly does challenge U.S. hegemony in the Pacific and its economic power worldwide. More than ever, Europeans, citizens and MPs see the U.S. as a great threat to their own survival and how it is trying to initiate war with Russia that can only have catastrophic consequences in Europe. In addition to acting on its own self-sense of American exceptionalism, there's the internal political aspect of why the U.S. has continued its national emergency against Iran. Trump is no friend of Iran, but his willingness to see countries' roles in the world different from that of the American foreign policy establishment is a threat to the status quo. Keeping the emergency in place does box Trump in from doing anything in the short term that might alter the dynamics in that region. Now, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov accuses the outgoing U.S. administration of not being honest in fighting terrorism in Syria. Lavrov said the Obama administration was deceitful when it came to differentiating terrorists, such as the Al Nusra Front, from the so-called moderate opposition. The top Russian diplomat expressed hope that the new U.S. administration under Donald Trump would cooperate more effectively on Syria. Lavrov, however, stressed that it is premature to talk about Trump's foreign policy and that Russia will speak about it after he takes office. The Russian foreign minister was briefing reporters on Moscow's foreign affairs in 2016. He also referred to the upcoming Astana talks on the Syria crisis and said discussions are expected to consolidate a ceasefire regime there. The hunt is on to find this man, Caleb Bartel. Yeah, he is wanted in the death of a beloved math teacher in Mesa. And ABC 15's Noah Helena Graf is live outside Mesa High School where that teacher taught. Noah, hey, uh, the suspect considered armed and dangerous? Yeah, I mean, Dan, he shot and killed a man, is accused of shooting him in cold blood. And it has sent a ripple effect here to Mesa High School where Ryan Zahner was a very popular teacher. But first, let's get straight to a look at the suspect because he is still on the run. His name is Caleb Bartels. He is 27 years old. He's about 5'10". You can see he's got those green eyes there. You might also recognize the car that he was last known to be driving. It's a 2007 Silver Pontiac Grand Prix. The license plate is on your screen right now. As Dan and Danielle mentioned, he is considered armed and dangerous. Now, police believe he went to Ryan Zahner's backyard and murdered him. Zahner, a math teacher here at Mesa High School, he's described as being young and vivacious with a heart of gold and a great smile. The school is planning to have counselors on hand for students all week. Of course, they're just returning today after having the holiday off yesterday. The community also trying to step up to help Zahner's family, Dan. Well, yeah, I know hey, a lot of people ask, what can they do in moments like this? We're hearing that a local restaurant uh, actually wants to help out Zahner's family. Yeah, uh, actually, Spinelli's on Mill Avenue in Tempe. Tomorrow, if you eat there, they're going to donate 20% of the proceeds from the day's sales back to Mr. Zahner's family. So just a small thing that you can do that could really make a big difference for his family during this tough time. All right, no, Helena. Well, hundreds of uh, U.S. troops have landed in Norway for a six-month deployment. Despite a warning from Russia, almost 300 U.S. Marines will participate in drills with the Norwegian Army less than 1,500 kilometers from the Russian border. Now, it's the first time since World War II that foreign troops have been allowed to be stationed in the Scandinavian country. Officials have denied any link between troops' deployment and NATO's concern 
concerns over Russia, but it coincides with the U.S. sending several thousand troops to Poland to beef up its Eastern European allies. Earlier, senior Russian officials said the deployment is part of a U.S. military buildup and that it makes Norway fair game in the event of a nuclear confrontation. The U.S.-led Western military alliance has ramped up its presence in Eastern Europe following the Ukraine crisis. Three suicide bombers linked to Boko Haram, including a 12-year-old girl, blew themselves up Monday at Nigeria's Northeastern University in Maguri. They killed a professor and another child. One student said the first blast ripped through the mosque where professors were praying and a second bomb detonated at the entrance of the gate. This is the first Boko Haram attack on the school. The Islamic group has killed more than 20,000 people. Back, outgoing CIA Director John Brennan is strongly rejecting President-elect Donald Trump's suggestion that he may have been the one to leak an unsubstantiated report. Uh, they're calling it a dossier. He also defended the integrity of the spy agency, telling the Wall Street Journal yesterday, quote, I would have no interest in trying to give that dossier any additional airtime. The feeling was wanting to make sure that given the very salacious nature of it, the President-elect was at least aware of it so he could take it into account and do what needs to be done. We are following breaking news out of North Haven this midday, detectives seizing electronics, equipment, and furniture from the Korean massage therapy spa on Washington Avenue. Investigators say it's all part of a month-long prostitution investigation. Police say there were no arrests today, but the investigation is still ongoing. Strong storms swept through Texas early Monday, bringing heavy rain, damaging winds, and even tornadoes. One near Houston sent patio furniture flying as it whipped across this neighborhood. Greg Gutierrez and his mother took cover in a bathtub as debris smashed through the windows of their home. It sounded like a freight train, you know, when I was on top, and then all of a sudden it's like, I think our house is gone. An icy mess in Iowa caused this truck to slide into a frozen lake. The two men inside are okay. A layer of ice covered the community of Dodge City, Kansas, bringing frozen tree branches crashing to the ground. Schools are closed today as utility crews work to restore power to thousands, something officials say could take days. Something this bad widespread, it's hard for them to get everywhere, so I know they've been doing the best they can. Here in Woodward, Oklahoma, people spent the day clearing the damage caused by the ice throughout the small city. It sounded like transformers just popping all night long. That was the trees popping. They just sound like explosions. Anyone who knows how to use a chainsaw is going to be in high demand in this part of Oklahoma. They're going to have to chop these trees apart and haul them off. Cleanup could take several weeks, but the good news is power is almost fully restored. A hunt for a killer in New Jersey. Three people, a woman and two men, found murdered inside a Jersey City home. The Hudson County prosecutor is leading the investigation. St. Mr. Magdalena Doris joins us live from Jersey City with more about the victims. Maggie. And Mary, we're just getting some late breaking information about who those victims were. Family and friends have been stopping by this apartment building, and they tell me one victim includes a young mother of one who was pregnant with her second child and a man who is a father of two. Monday night, just after 10 p.m., Jersey City police made a gruesome discovery when they responded to calls of shots fired on Fulton Avenue. Investigators walked inside this apartment building and found three people shot to death. It's sad, because I'm, I'm still in the daze, because... <laughs> Police have not released the identities of the victim. Bernard Brewer says his son, 31-year-old Quadel Chisholm, is among the dead. He leaves behind uh, two little children that, that, that's now going to grow up without a dad. Friends say found inside with Chisholm was a young mother and her boyfriend. The woman who was gunned down was pregnant with her second child. She's pregnant. She had a baby inside of her. Like, she didn't deserve that. How can you see a girl pregnant? And you don't care about killing her, you don't care about killing anybody. As for the suspects involved, Mr. Brewer is hopeful that justice will be served in this life or the next, relying on his faith in God. He already got a GPS on every one of them. He already know where every one of them at, what every one of them doing right now. 
And most recently, we just received an update from the Hudson County Prosecutor's Office. They say the woman has been identified as 25-year-old uh, Jayana Lee, and uh, the man that was with her is 26-year-old Ashir Bailey. There have been no arrests as of yet. Only days before President-elect Donald Trump is set to take over the White House, and he is already taking big risks for the U.S. Trump has promised on multiple occasions to provide more jobs for Americans, and that's exactly what he plans to do, whether that means America might take a few hits along the way. Trump told foreign car companies in an interview with German newspaper Bild this week, that if they plan to bring cars into America, there will be a 35 percent import tax. This may increase revenue for the U.S., but could also deter business. Well, Chris and Mary, prosecutors say that the alleged shooter is David Hardy from right here in Mount Vernon. They say he is a known gang member. He was attempting to shoot at another gang member when he fired that fatal shot that killed Shamoya McKenzie. I spoke with her mother uh, earlier today who says this has been unbearable for her family, but she's hoping that Shamoya's death won't be in vain. It's not easy. It is not easy, although they caught him. Nadine McKenzie grappling with the anguish of losing her only child. Today, she told us she has one question for her daughter's accused killer. Why? Why? You know, you take the law in your hands. Prosecutors say 21-year-old David Hardy of Mount Vernon is now in custody for second-degree murder in the death of Shamoya McKenzie. Police say it was a stray bullet fired by Hardy that hit the 13-year-old in the head as she sat in the passenger seat of her mom's car New Year's Eve on her way home from basketball practice. Just think about your sister, your mother, your wife, or whoever you with. If someone killed him, how would you feel? Investigators say Hardy, an alleged gang member, was aiming for another man who was grazed by the gunfire. After the shooting, they say Hardy fled Mount Vernon and headed south, triggering a multi-state manhunt. We believe he went down, went down south to, I uh, believe, South Carolina, and uh, just returned shortly before he was arrested. For Mrs. McKenzie, it's relief, but little consolation for her daughter, a star athlete and scholar who she buried last week. This is a child we're ever going to adore and want to see shine. You understand? And why she? That question that everyone is asking, why Shemoya? And we have no answers yet. Well, David Hardy, the suspect in this case, is scheduled to be arraigned on second-degree murder charges as well as illegal possession of a weapon. The prosecutor also telling us that he will likely face additional charges, including attempted murder for allegedly trying to kill that other gang member. All fake news. President-elect Donald Trump may be on the road to making peace between Russia and the U.S., but it is a different story entirely with China. Trump has been very vocal with his criticisms of China, and now the country is getting upset. The recent feud between Trump and China is over the island of Taiwan. Taiwan has been self-ruled since 1941, but Beijing still considers it part of China and does not appreciate Trump's interest in its affairs. A man from Westfield is being charged in connection to a back-to-back -back arm, ro actually back-to-back -back arm robberies in Chicopee on Monday. Chicopee police officer Mike Wilk told 22 News that 36-year-old William Welch allegedly robbed both the Stop and Go on Prospect Street at gunpoint and the Honeyland Farms on Montgomery Street. Officer Wilk said detectives received tips from the public and were able to identify Welch. He was arrested at his home in Westfield without incident. He's being charged with two counts of armed robbery with a firearm and also had two warrants out of Springfield and of w in Westfield. Police dog from Montague helped Greenfield police find 400 bags of heroin that was hidden away in a car's glove compartment. Greenfield police posted on their official Facebook page that 27-year-old Samantha Carey of Greenfield and 35-year-old Jim's Grand Pierre of Athol were arrested during a Monday night traffic stop on River Street. The department's posting states that an officer was checking on Deerfield Street uh, for Carey's vehicle for possibly being involved in drug transactions. Inside the glove compartment, police said they found a hidden bag that contained some 400 bags of suspected heroin. Carey and Grand Pierre are both charged with possession of heroin, heroin with intent to distribute. 
New at noon, a man who had been placed on the Springfield Police Department's most wanted list was arrested by city police, state troopers, and members of the U.S. Marshals Task Force today. Springfield Police Sergeant John Delaney told 22 News police were looking for 22-year-old Travis Lewis to Springfield after a series of home break-ins. Lewis was arrested around 7 this morning in an apartment on William Sands Jr. Road in Springfield. He faces breaking and entering and larceny charges, and Sergeant Delaney said more charges are possible. In Virginia Beach, police and Regent University campus officers are working together to find the man they say assaulted a student. Police say the suspect was last seen between 5.30 and 6 o'clock this morning at Foundation Hall. 10 on your side's Jason Marks is live in Virginia Beach. And Jason, first of all, how is the student? Student is going to be okay. Student was taken to the hospital. We're told that she's still there at this hour, but minor injuries. Now, as you mentioned, this attack happened early this morning here at Regent. It really has left this tight-knit community here at the university really concerned about what happened. Beijing is in a standoff with the incoming U.S. administration over Taiwan, which it regards as an inalienable part of China. For decades, U.S. presidents have upheld a one-China policy. But in a recent interview with the Wall Street Journal, Donald Trump said that was negotiable. Chinese state media blasted him for playing with fire. In an editorial, the China Daily warned Trump that China would have to take off the gloves if he continued to use this gambit upon taking office. While the Global Times wrote that China may be prompted to speed up reunification with Taiwan. Taiwan, where a nationalist government was set up after years of civil war in 1949, remains an extremely delicate issue in China. Tensions with the U.S. have escalated since Trump recently accepted a phone call from the president of Taiwan. Some of Trump's assertions have spurred concerns, too, about the prospects of a trade war. They haven't played by the rules, and I know it's time that they're going to start. They're going to start. They've got to. Trump has accused China of unfairly devaluing its currency to boost exports, while in fact, in recent months, China has done the opposite. The president-elect has threatened to impose high tariffs that could imperil Chinese economic growth goals. Trump's pick for Secretary of State, Rex Tillerson, suggested physically blocking China's access to artificial islands it has built in the South China Sea, raising questions in China over whether he was expressing his personal views or the next administration's policy. In short, seen from China, the incoming U.S. administration seems determined to shake the foundations of U.S.-China relations, yet its plans remain unclear. As Wall Street Journal columnist Andrew Brown puts it, the biggest question is, Mr. Trump has threatened a trade war with China. Will this trigger a shooting war? Evanston, and that's right, that's located right side, right outside of Chicago, rather. The video was just recently released. The man says that officers used excessive force after a passerby called 911 to report a possible car break-in. As Dean Reynolds shows us what happened next, it was recorded by a camera in the car the alleged suspect was driving. I think this person is still following me. Now I see it. On October 10th, 2015, a dash cam in Lawrence Crosby's car picked up his cell phone conversation. So they're trying to play some games. All right, I'm about to go to the police station now. The 25-year-old Northwestern University Ph.D. candidate considered going to the Evanston Police Department for protection from a trailing driver. You know how it is with black people, man. They think they're always trying to do something wrong. Little did he know, just minutes earlier, that driver following behind had called the cops on him, accusing him of grand theft auto. He was African-American with a black hood. In his rearview mirror, Crosby watched the police creep closer. See, I knew it was there. 
Moments later, the engineering student got out with his hands up and was taken down by four officers. On the ground, on the ground! This is vehicle January 23rd, 2015. From Libertyville Chevrolet. I have all the evidence. This is something that could have been checked on a computer. Tim Tui is Crosby's attorney. He was struck at least by one police officer. An independent police review authority. We found that the Chicago Police Department engages in a pattern or practice of using excessive force, including deadly force and non deadly force. This pattern includes, for example, shooting at people who present no immediate threat and tasing people for not following verbal commands. This conduct doesn't only harm residents, it endangers officers. It results in avoidable deaths and injuries and trauma. And it erodes police community trust, trust that truly is the cornerstone of public safety. We found that this pattern of unconstitutional force is largely attributable to systemic deficiencies within the CPD and the city. We found that CPD does not adequately train its officers to use the appropriate amount of force. We found that Chicago's accountability systems are broken. Many complaints that should be investigated are not. And when investigations do occur, they are glacially slow and staffed by overworked and undertrained investigators who often fail to obtain basic witness statements and evidence. Officers are too rarely held accountable for misconduct, and when they are, discipline is unpredictable and ineffective. And we found that CPD is failing to provide officers with the support that they need to deal with the stress and trauma of their jobs. The failures that we identified and that we heard about from residents and officers alike have deeply eroded community trust, particularly in African American and Latino communities suffering the most from gun violence on Chicago's south and west sides. These neighborhoods are the hardest hit by CPD's officer with multiple blows. Why am I being in the We got to verify the car is not stolen. Mate. When the police on the scene confirmed the car was Crosby's, one officer reacted this way. I said, I didn't shoot you, man. You should feel lucky for that. As for that concerned caller, once she witnessed the arrest, she seemed to waver. I feel really like I feel really like I don't I didn't mean to like racial profile. Crosby was charged with resisting arrest but was acquitted last year. For CBS this morning, Dean Reynolds, Chicago. Me too. A lawsuit filed on Crosby's behalf last year demands the city pay him $50,000. No Evanston police officer were disciplined. And an internal investigation determined their acts complied with policy, but the department has promised changes and challenges. Elements of the video they call that problematic. That video, guys, is so tough to watch. You wonder, how is he resisting arrest that even when you do the right thing, apparently, yeah. it still ends up in a bad way? Well, his hands are up, his you know, and when up. you're pulled over, you just have an officer usually come up and yeah. say, can I see your ID, mm -hmm. can I see your registration? It's usually a different type of encounter. Mm. I need First to hear more. Yeah. was apparent on the video. Yes. yes. And to hear the officer say, be glad I didn't shoot you. Very mm. tough. Yeah. Since we launched this investigation in December of 2015, the Justice Department has deployed our largest team ever in a policing pattern or practice case to conduct a thorough and fair investigation of the Chicago Police Department. Donald Trump, he recently sat down for a joint interview with two major European newspapers where he slammed German Chancellor Angela Merkel for her open door policy on refugees. Now, Trump told the papers, quote, I think she made one very catastrophic mistake, and that was taking all of these illegals, you know, taking all of the people from wherever they come from. And nobody even knows where they come from. So I think she made a catastrophic mistake, a very bad mistake. A black man in Illinois is suing police after he says that he was falsely and violently arrested 
2015 encounter was captured on several cameras. It happened in a pattern of unlawful force and breakdown in the city's accountability systems. These breakdowns breed distrust and undermine police legitimacy in the very communities that need fair, proactive policing the most. Distrust of law enforcement makes residents unwilling to share information, and that makes it harder for officers to solve and prevent crimes. Chicago's leaders, including especially the mayor and superintendent, of course, are aware of many of these problems and, to their credit, have been working to address them. As noted in this report, we've already improved and expanded de-escalation training, and we're upgrading our use of force policies. We're providing every officer with body cameras and tasers. We've expanded recruitment efforts to ensure that the department draws on all the communities that make up this great city. We've improved transparency and strengthened our oversight and accountability. We have, we have changed the way our first responders react to individuals with serious mental illness so that they know the difference between a mental health call and a crime call. But I want to be clear. The Chicago Police Department, the city of Chicago, is already on the road to reform and there are no U-turns on that road. I am pleased to announce today that the Department of Justice and the City of Chicago have agreed to begin negotiations on an independently monitored, court-enforceable consent decree. It is very, very clear a transition is coming in Washington, but the departure of one or two people